Hello, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Artistic Journalism Public Lecture. My name is Hide Ogawa, Director of Arts Electronica Future Lab. So today, uh, I have a wonderful opportunity to have this public lecture from Arts Electronica Linz, Austria. Uh, this course, Artistic Journalism, uh, in today's age of overfloating information, what is a new way to listen carefully and think deeply and slowly about facts and issues rather than uh, simply consuming uh, or reacting to information and the news? Artistic journalism is a process of drawing a picture of the future through uh, paying attention to the various creative questions that artists create. Uh, in this course, we will create a dialogue with a new knowledge that cannot be conveyed by books, newspaper, and online media alone, and discuss how to apply this dialogue to future life and policy through the activities of our sectonica based in Austria, Linz. So today, I have one who guest. Uh, Christoph Kremer, who is a uh, managing director of Arts Electronica Center. Welcome. Good morning, everybody. Uh, before uh, asking him for the guide, uh, I would like to explain a little bit about o overview of today's index. Um, today, first, uh, uh, basically, uh, this uh, lecture is consisted of two parts. First is a special guided tour by Christoph to go through the exhibition Understanding AI at our Electronica Center. Then 10 minutes later, 10 minutes after the 10 minutes break, we are focusing on the special topic, Me and the Machines. So by together with uh, Nicole Gurunais, who is the head of uh, education and content development of, uh, at our Electronica. So let's begin, Chris. So. Yes, thank you, Hidi, for the introduction. Yeah, we are here in the Ars Electronica Center in Linz. And our center is called the Museum of the Future, and we are really uh, working, or we are interested in the intersection of art, technology, and society. So we are focusing on technology development, which influences our society, and we take artistic works to make this influence a little bit clearer, and to find out, okay, how can we deal as humans, as a society, which different technology developments. And what we've seen in the first few what seconds, <laughs> this is a small autonomous car. We trained here, we trained this for autonomous driving. And the wonderful thing is that we can do this with our workshops in the Asiatronica Center together with school classes. Uh, and the one thing is what we can show here is that it's not that big issue to train an artificial intelligence to drive around here, but when we only change one single thing in, uh, uh, in, in this, in this uh, structure here, the car is not driving anymore. In this way, we trained it. So what we want to show, and this is what we try to do the next 45 minutes, is to understand a little bit more about artificial intelligence. How does it work? Mm -hmm. Where are the borders? And how could we or should we use this really powerful tool for us as a, a society in a correct way. Mm -hmm. So, And one of the big issues, of course, is in which one is artificial intelligence uh, interesting to use? Mm -hmm. And so the first question, what we always try to uh, find out with, together with our visitors is, what is artificial intelligence? Yeah, very basic. What, what is the really basic? What mm -hmm. is it? And what we try to explain it in really in brief is artificial intelligence in our sense, and in the way we are uh, coping with it, is a computer system imitating human abilities, like driving a car, like learning, object detection, playing music, and so on. So every computer system which is trying to imitate humans' ability is under this big name of artificial intelligence. And let's take a look. How does it work? Yeah, let's go. And uh, the point is a dr drastic shift from automation to autonomy, right? Because automation was a historical development and all technologies were together with automation in the past you know, centuries. But now we are entering into the new paradigm of the world of autonomy. So autonomous car is one of the elements. 
but uh, to understand the new you know, world uh, developed, uh, being developed from now on, we needed to understand the AI, right? Yes, and this is, I think, it, 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 it's a good uh, thing to, to talk about automation, autonomous cars, because we also have to learn what is the best case for this autonomous use of uh, this technology, it's a new technology, but it's not that new. It's, to be honest, it's 20, 30, 40 years old. The first chess, chess computer defeating Garry Kasparov, this is more than 30 years ago. Absolutely. Okay, and what we created for our visitors here is uh, artificial intelligence learning track. So here in this course of uh, installations, we show really in, in, a, in a precise way how neural networks are working. We start here with one neuron which is in the spotlight and we go on and go on and it's getting more complicated and more deeper into really the thing what is a neural network and how can we train it and this is what we want to show in our first installation. So please join like this. There are many uh, system in you know, a description and also there are many uh, explanations about the powerful AI algorithm as well. Yeah, so this is a little bit of the basic, what is a neuron, how does it work together? And here we try to explain our visitors about the training of a neural network. And we have here a use case which is quite simple. We have an artificial syst system and now we can, or now I, show you how we can train this system on only one purpose. The system is trained for finding out whether an animal is dangerous for a mouse or not. This is the only question. Dangerous for a mouse or not. So we have here this, this system and now we can start this training. Training means here now I have images from different animals, for example here a fox. And what I do by training is, I put this here in front of the camera and now we see, okay, the first judgment is by accident. In this case it's wrong, it was going for to not dangerous, but I know or I'm really convinced that a fox is dangerous for a mouse, so I learn this, okay, no, that's not, it's really dangerous, so I have to learn it. I take the next animal, zebra, and I make the same thing again. This is correct. I say, okay, not dangerous. And this is the learning process. What we do, and we do this with hundreds, with thousands of single images. The next one I have got here is an eagle. And maybe we can now see. Now the judgment, we only learned two animals and now the judgment is the first time really correct and say, okay, that's really dangerous. And we see here now the learning process. It's getting interesting, more interesting for us as we want to understand the basic of this training is when there is an animal like this elephant, an elephant, and now we find out, okay, is an elephant dangerous for a mouse, yes or not? Hide, what do you think? Is an animal, uh, is an elephant dangerous for a mouse? No. No? Maybe you at home can judge it for yourself. And I did this with a lot of groups, hundreds of groups, mm -hmm. and there is not the one uh, Say, result. Yeah, because dangerous. It can be dangerous, I don't know it. I'm <laughs> not an uh, expert for elephants. Yeah. Hide, you're not an expert for elephants either, but we as training of the trainings of this, we have now to decide. Yeah. And okay, I follow Hide and I say, not dangerous. Now the system learns or has learned that an elephant is not dangerous for a mouse. But what is when Hide is wrong? Mm -hmm. Maybe an elephant is really dangerous for mice. What have we done now? We have learned the system incorrectly, mm -hmm. but not 
by purpose to say, okay, I want to make this mm -hmm. working not per uh, perfectly. It was really only the, the meaning or the thinking of HIDA. And this is happening with every single animal we got. The next animal is a little bit uh, clearer. It's an owl. And I put it here again. And okay, perfect, it works. Yes, this is really dangerous for a mouse. Mm -hmm. And so we can now go on and then we can find out maybe how does it work. For example, we have here got a horse and maybe we can take a look whether this system already is able to judge about the perfect. Horse is not dangerous, hopefully, mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, and this is what we really want to uh, dig out in this installation is the first thing, how it works. Okay, this is quite clear to, to say, okay, you show images and, you, and then you judge whether it's dangerous or not. But the really crucial thing and the dangerous thing is what is happening when the one, the people who are training artificial intelligence are doing this incorrectly. Christoph, it's surprisingly similar to also what we, you know, humans are learning, you know, in, in your process. Because this neural uh, network training is uh, in a way uh, applying also, you know, our human process uh, effectively, you know, for uh, educating the idea to the machines. Absolutely, absolutely. So this is why it's, there are so many uh, similarities between our human thinking and what computers are doing. Uh, and this is what we have. We have the same challenge to make sure or to, to think about. It's not the thing that it's every time working correctly. Absolutely. As we humans are not uh, yeah. free from and mistakes. Uh, depending the systems on the teachers. You know, and depending on the teachers. Who is teaching what? Yes. So, and this is creating bias and also you know, educational basis for also machines to judge. And to be honest, there is no way we have that we have to face it. There is always a little bit of bias in every one of us because we have our teachers, we have our families, they are teaching us. And of course they are teaching, not on purpose, but they are doing it. They're teaching their own bias mm -hmm. into us, into Absolutely. everyone. And this is what we have the same thing here at computer systems. Yes. Let's take a look inside the thinking of a computer because this is what we see here in the, in the final installation of this track is the inside of an object detection system. Let's yeah. take a look. So by the way, this artistic journalism is a special collaboration with Keio University SFC Japan. And uh, I would like to thank Keio University SFC for creating this really wonderful uh, opportunity for all of us. And uh, also, if you have any kind of comments, creative questions, please post to the YouTube Live. Enjoy. Yeah, as we are coming closer to this installation, we now see the computer is working, is thinking, and I want to explain you how we try to show this process to our visitors. And we had the first installation was the neural network training. Now we have here a system which is trained. So this is finished, training is finished, and we can now try to figure out how does it work. It is a really simple uh, object detection and this means it's capable of detecting uh, 1,000 objects and there are about 5,000 images like this which were trained. So 5,000 for this thousand, so we have about 5 million uh, training data sets to be seen. Okay. okay, let's start. We put one object into this object detection, and now we can see, okay, the starting point is this image for the computer. And as we all know, computers cannot work with these images. They have to translate this image into zero and one, binary system. And all what we see here, every single small cube what we've got here, is a convolutional filter. So we have here, hundreds of convolutional filter and the only goal of all these operations happening every time in, in a computer when it tries to make an object detection is that there is this final result. 
this pattern. And what is now happening, and this is really the most important thing on understanding how artificial intelligence work, is that this pattern, all the other operations are not used, only this pattern is used, and this is now compared to all the other patterns which this system already learned. So when we think about what we did in the first installation, we learned patterns. So we showed an animal, for us it's an animal, for the computer it's a pattern. And this pattern was divided between two dangerous and not dangerous. And what we've got here is we have patterns and they were labeled for, for example, for a zebra or an elephant or something like this. And now there is a new pattern and now the comparison process is going on and we see here now perfect this uh, fits 100 percent this pattern is 100 percent similar to patterns which were learned as zebras it, it's getting a little bit more difficult when we put for example this cup into this system picture cup that's perfect I turn it now around and then we can see Base. ways, beaker, maybe I put it a little bit every more. Every lamp as well. So you see everything when I, now we have table lamp, lampshade. So it is a cup and, but the object detection does not work correctly. Again, we have now, we see here for us humans, really important that there is this small thing where we hold the cup, but it's still not cup table lamp. It does not mean that this is not working correctly. It's working perfectly. What is happening is, again, the pattern here is more similar to the table lamp pattern than it's to a cup pattern. Mm -hmm. And this is what's happening inside of every artificial intelligence. We have learning data. We have the patterns, and then we have this comparison of the patterns, and then we have an outcome. And this outcome is not always right, because maybe the pattern is similar with different things, and this is what we all have to be sure. And for example, when I put my hand into this system, the thing what is coming out is band aid but there is no band-aid on my hand. So the reason is not that the mis misjudging of the computer, the reason is that the images for band-aid were a lot of hands with a band-aid on it. And so it's clear, mm -hmm. the pattern is similar and then the system says, okay, this is band-aid, but there is no band-aid on it. So this is for us really important and this is what we start with every tour is understanding of this artificial intelligence on this basic. And now we want to focus on some interesting examples where artificial intelligence is used by companies, by artists, and though we can get a little idea of where are the borders, how can we use it, where does it bring us as a society really a benefit, and, of course, where is it maybe dangerous to Absolutely. use it? So as Christopher explained, the, such technologies are going to be everywhere in our society. And uh, so uh, coming back to the discussion about comparison between automation and autonomy, the point is how to design the proper frame and the context, you know, and also how can we take care about the data set? And as a quality of data set later we are discussing, but as an entire process and impact to our society is significant. Yeah. Yes, it, it's really this significant way that the technology is so powerful. And we use it. We use it sometimes with a really big joy. Mm -hmm. We use it with a little bit of fear. Uh, and, and a lot of people say, okay, I don't want to use it. Others say, oh, we have to use it, it's so great. But this is not what we want to so, so, uh, judge, whether it's good to use technology or not. What we want to find out is, 
okay, where are all these different layers and how can we dig out the uh, points which should be uh, in our decision. Mm -hmm. What we've got here is a great example of research by a few universities and they really created this anatomy of an AI system. You can watch this in the internet. It's uh, anatomy of dot AI. And there you got all this wonderful graphic and all the background information. Only about this, the, 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 uh, the most important thing here is this graphic shows how Amazon Echo is working. How does it really work when I go to Amazon Echo and I ask what is the weather? And then we see here what is happening. We've got here the human operator and we've got her all the, op, the Amazon Echo dot. We've got here the internet infrastructure and then all these things is brought to the Amazon incorporation infrastructure in California. We've got here, and now this is where artificial intelligence starts. The Alexa voice service. We need, or Amazon needs, a really powerful artificial intelligence for the voice service to detect, okay, what is the question. It has to work all over the world, no matter when you're using it in Japan or using it in Austria or using it in Brazil. It has to work. And this is one of the most powerful artificial intelligence systems uh, developed in the last years, and it's worked really great. But this is, we have to bring this information to California. Then this Alexa voice service finds out what was the question. Then that the next point is easy. You can find out what is the weather in the place where the Amazon Echo is standing, for example, now in Austria. And then all this information is coming back. And one second later, the Amazon Echo gives me the answer. Today, it's sunny. Mm -hmm. Wonderful thing. But by doing this, we really, the, 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 the system is not judging between, is this a serious question? Is this a joke question? Is this even a question? Because it listens all the time. And this is for our private sphere, of course, uh, a serious threat mm -hmm. and okay we can decide to use it now they are the first uh, systems which are really created for uh, the kids rooms to use Amazon Echo Alexa all this stuff for kids of course it's great for kids mm -hmm. they have a lot of questions we all know this I'm, I'm a father of a small kid he the uh, the same we as parents we have to uh, we, we are facing hundreds, thousands of questions every single day, wouldn't it be nice to put an all-knowing system into it and the kid can now ask them why, 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 and this system gives the answers. We have to decide. Absolutely. This is what we have to decide as a society. Yeah. By the way, this project uh, was done by uh, Bela Danjola and Kate Crawford, and uh, I would say this is a very cool artistic research to you know, open that dialogue, and, but uh, together with a very deep you know, research by artists. So I think uh, normally you know, this kind of you know, process is not uh, visualized, but uh, artists are now you know, looking for the you know, critical uh, points about the uh, you know, uh, contents that we needed to discuss. So, but uh, as Christoph mentioned, uh, all products, all services around us uh, is now uh, very complicated. So we needed to also think about the new kind of uh, people, new uh, talent who can design effectively such new architecture. It's uh, experience architecture also, you know, including many factors, not just AI, software, hardware, but you know, all stuff uh, adds one experience will be quite an important scope of, you know, design, uh, designing of the architecture. So, okay, so then, so for designing this architecture, so there are many, you know, challenges still. And yes. uh, so uh, then uh, there are also, you know, ongoing existing issues in the other products. Look. Yes, 
So all these systems, these uh, assistants, they have one big issue that they are listening what we are saying the whole day. And of course, all the companies behind it, whether it's Google or it's Amazon, they're all promised, no, no, we are not doing anything with your data. We are only using it for the questions that you are giving it. Can we rely on this? I don't know. These are all systems who are working autonomously. Mm -hmm. So why can they say, okay, they are using it correctly? And this is the point where art artists now again are really important. And we have here a great project. It's called Project Elias. It's from uh, Björn Karman and uh, Tore Knudsen mm -hmm. from Denmark. And they created this protection for a system. And you can put this on it. It's really a simple thing what we see here. And maybe I try that you can hear <laughs> what is happening. So there is a little bit of a noise inside. So when I put it over it, the system does not longer work. But of course, we want to use it. But we want to use it when we decide to use it. And so quite similar to what we're doing with the Amazon or with Alexa. And this, the first thing is we have to train this system for a specific name. I now maybe say Hide. Yeah. And then I say Hide, and then this noise is turned off, and we can use the system as we want to use it. And when we then say Hide again, this noise is turning on again, and the system is protected. And so this project is a really great example of, yes, we have this technology, it's great, it's a powerful tool, but we want to use this tool when we want to do it, and that, not because only the tool is here in this, is... Uh, um, influencing our private sphere. Absolutely. Are we just uh, consuming such a new product provided by high-tech, you know, platformers and uh, companies? Or are we, you know, uh, able to, in a way, humanize and adopt those technologies to our comfortable ways? I think artists created such, you know, nice connector and, uh, uh, in a way, new in social interfaces to, uh, you know, uh, make a balance in our daily lives. Then, so shall we yeah. go to the next location? Yes, of location? course, because this yeah. is what we want to know in the next two installations. Yeah. We have the great opportunity to share great artworks using artificial intelligence and showing us limitations of the system. Because this is what we really are using in the Arts Electronica Center since 1996, is artistic approaches helping us as a society understand technology in a better way. Absolutely. So this is what I meant today at the beginning. This is not reading like newspaper, right? Experience. And experience yeah. the future is a point of this environment. Then so let's go to the piece here. And it's all about for discussing what is the meaning of data set? What's the meaning of education as we have discussed so far? Yeah. So in our first steps, we learned about training, about data, about object detection. But it's not so clear what does this really mean? How can we use it? Okay, voice detection with Alexa, with Amazon Echo. What we see here is a great work by uh, Mimo Akten from Turkey. Uh, learning to see gloomy Sunday. You can take a look onto your, the YouTube channel of uh, Memo Akten. You can only type in gloomy Sunday and you see this great work here. What we've got here is the interaction. And what Memo Akten did is really uh, interesting uh, artistic work. He created different data sets. Uh, for example, the one data set we've got here is the night sky. So and now we have uh, the next data set, so this is changing every few seconds. We have another data set of sea, coast, and everything. Now you see what I'm putting into this system. The data set interprets it as a coast or as sea, as waves. And every time I change it here, we can see a different uh, coast structure. Now the next data set uh, Memo Akten uh, create, created was uh, fire. And I'm here putting now the things away and we see here okay, now everything is 
is burning and so we can really interact in an easy way and we see here what is the, the input and everything what is the input for the system is uh, interpreted as the different data sets mean and now we have a data set for flowers. Wonderful. Now flowers are growing out of my hand. I really love this data set most. Good that it comes now. So the data set is only flowers and it doesn't matter what is the input, everything is interpreted as flowers. So and this is what Nemo Acton here showed in a perfect way. Artificial intelligence is a powerful tool. But it's powerful for really the specific use case the tool was created for. And what the data set was created for, this is the crucial thing. And now, here we know it. Now we have this data set for clouds and for sky. And when we know this, we can know how to use it. And this is the most important question, I think, for us as, as using technologies. What was this technology created for? Was it uh, created in a perfect and um, maybe say not biased way? And then we can use it for this specific use case and not for everything. And it's not the generalized tool. We can use artificial intelligence for everything. No, there is a tool. We can specify it and then we can use it in a correct way. Yeah. What I want to say here is uh, he is not making art, you know, using uh, AI algorithm. Rather, you know, he is making artistic uh, project to open such discussions as Christoph uh, promoted today. Uh, you know, uh, media artists can do that because they can access to the deeper knowledge and also through the uh, practices to touch to the deep levels of AI algorithm itself. So this is, I, I would say, uh, he is, in a way, artistic journalist who are combining the latest findings to the public. Yeah, latest finding is an interesting link to not this installation, but to the things what happened the last weeks. Uh, maybe you have read it uh, that some of the uh, startups dealing with artificial intelligence and were highly uh, uh, promoted by different companies are now getting problems because they cannot deliver what uh, they promised and this is what one thing what we've seen we've started with this autonomous car what we trained and i can remember in 2015 we had an autonomous car here at as electronica festival it was from mercedes and the developer in 2015 they told everyone you will see in five years 2020 there will be autonomous driving in the city of Linz. Now we have 2022 and I haven't seen any, <laughs> not only one single really autonomous driving yeah. car. So it has to change, of course, what we are, uh, what is our goal. And now, when you now listen to uh, car industry and what they are promising is, in my opinion, I think it's really clear, it's not that there will be an autonomous driving car where you get step inside and you can sleep. Mm -hmm. What they now say is that artificial intelligence will be perfect assistance systems. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think this is an interesting uh, switch between, I promise you, you will have a car which drives on, on itself, or you get a mm -hmm. perfect car, you drive, but you as a human are assisted by technology so that the driving is as safe as possible. Mm -hmm. And this is maybe interesting, uh, uh, example in this big, big industry. And I don't know if one of us will ever see an autonomous car in mm -hmm. the streets of Linz. But what we see, and this is what's happening is now, and what has happened in the last years, we see a lot of cars with great uh, assistance systems making traffic safer. Mm -hmm. And uh, our final uh, artistic project here in our understanding artificial intelligence uh, exhibition here in the Astrotronica Center is the non-facial portrait from Sin Jeong Bak and Kim Jong Hoon from uh, uh, Korea. And they are uh, artists who are working on a lot of different projects. We had several of them in our museum. And this one is perfect to, to end our first session. They were asking about 
face recognition. Face recognition is one of these powerful use of artificial intelligence in different cases. For example, it's perfect for our camera inside our mobile phones. They detect the face and then they can focus on this face. But not only for this positive use, but also for uh, 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 surveillance and putting it into uh, uh, systems where cameras are uh, surveilling all the public places. And they were asking the thing, okay, what is necessary to change in a portrait that it's non-facial, but not non-facial for us, but non-facial for this yeah. uh, face recognition systems. And so we see here uh, some examples where every single of these portraits are not recognized as a face by artificial intelligence. And here this is maybe the most impressive thing is that this, for us as humans, it's clear to see this is a face. The computer, the artificial intelligence system, does not recognize this as a face. And of course, the last two years of pandemic, we are all wearing the masks <laughs> and we really, really, really fast found out that the face recognition of our iPhones are not working because of the masks. And so there is, of course, a limitation of all these systems. And there, is, there are artists who can really find out these limitations. Mm -hmm. And this is what we here brought together, what we compiled here with hundreds of, uh, hundreds of examples. And to find out understanding of artificial intelligence, but not only as a technology, but as a tool for us as a society and finding out how to use it, when to use it, and of course, when not to use it. Absolutely, yeah. This project is a very symbolic project, isn't it, for discussing the point. And uh, yeah, this is not solving any kind of a service or product. Uh, and uh, so again, you know, I want to also emphasize on the role of art. Uh, this, uh, again, this is not serving for the product and service development, but uh, really uh, creating a question for our humanity. So what uh, are we doing? Uh, what are we able to do with AI? And uh, or what's the you know, differences between AI and human, human beings? So this is <laughs> ultimately kind of exploration uh, of the borders between human perception and AI perception. But once again, the AI itself was educated by humans. Also, again, this is a very interesting loop of questioning. Uh, today, we discussed a lot of you know, key elements of machine learning and also data set. What I want to, uh, at the end, discuss with Christoph is also uh, bias. Because I, maybe you, <laughs> Everyone is full of bias. We believe, I'm no, not without any bias, but, but sorry. I, I, honestly, I'm only biased, <laughs> simply to say. Yeah. Because, but the point is how to respect you know, different biases, how to connect the different biases as well. But uh, what do you think about the bias uh, you know, uh, through the kind of metaphor of AI, because we, Found our society is full of bias. But uh, I would say through the mirror of AI, we could find this very fundamental, you know, kind of philosophical point. Yeah. I think this is the, the, the really uh, interesting part when we think about how can artificial intelligence help our society in judging things without or without or almost without bias. Mm -hmm. Because when we are judging things as a humans, our bias are inside. And of course, we can try to figure out which are the, the elements, which are uh, the judgment points. Uh, and this is what will be the, the point of the next thing. How can we make the judgment of an artificial intelligence uh, explainable so that we as humans can rely on it and can say, OK, this is where we trust. Mm -hmm. and. There are a lot of different research on this topic. And one thing is, especially as we use it as a, as a machine, as a computer, of course, we can define the judgment points. Mm -hmm. What are the things in which bias we don't want to have? 
and we can define them for in, in a computer we can define this as humans it's not that easy I, of course i can say to you Hida, you have to judge without any bias mm -hmm. is it really possible mm -hmm. i'm not sure about it but a machine we can teach when we teach it correctly that the machine got no bias or at least only so few bias it doesn't matter mm -hmm. as we can make this training process mm -hmm. and then this uh, judging process in this way what we think is the correct one and then now we, we can get go to an interesting mm -hmm. point is from which uh, perspective correct mm -hmm. correct from the perspective of uh, a country like Austria mm -hmm. correct in the perspective of a country like Iran or Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. correct in the perspective of the uh, view of the United States mm -hmm. and I can see I, I, I'm sure you get that point that it's what is correct is always a question of the point of view mm -hmm. yeah and, and how to overcome with this uh, kind of contradictions because uh, we believe we are yeah. correct, we are right. And but this is what, what, what is happening. Yeah, this is, I think out. this is what's happening with, with, with now with this, all these social networks mm -hmm. which are going all over the world. Yeah. Then there is not the, 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 the view of a different country, but it's the view of a society or a view of a peer group. But to overcome this, this is now the question what we have to, uh, we have to, uh, to, to find out or what, what we try to, uh, to answer. We cannot answer it as a, as a museum, but I'm sure this is the, the correct question what we have to ask again and again mm -hmm. and again. Is this technology helping us as a society mm -hmm. getting to uh, decisions which are bias-free mm -hmm. and which then are correct and when they are bias-free and they are correct, then we should trust them. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would say uh, not trying to uh, be bias-free because it's, it's quite difficult. But rather, how can we create a system or a platform to discuss the you know, point? So that might be uh, more important. So this case here, Arts Electronica Center, which is a museum of the future, school of the future, this kind of a new role of, you know, center is uh, uh, really uh, emerging, as my opinion. So how do you feel about this kind of demands and also feedback from audience regarding these emerging technologies? Uh, there is a really uh, a, a heterogeneous uh, decision or a mm. heterogeneous feeling. Mm. There is a lot of fear in that all this technology is uh, changing our society in a way we don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And the demand is, and this is of course uh, our, our role or what is demanded is, we have to make exhibitions like this mm -hmm. about understanding this artificial intelligence, uh, explaining it and helping uh, to get the, the, the uh, de decisions mm -hmm for us as a society. Mm -hmm. So this is the really big, big, big demand and everyone who is going through the exhibition, even if they are experts, mm -hmm. they afterwards say, okay, now it helped me to understand this really uh, complicated topic a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And as we started with the thing from uh, automation to autonomous, it took us years. More than years. More than years, <laughs> decades to use automation in a perfect way. Mm -hmm. And it will take us again years or decades mm -hmm. to use the autonomous system in the way we as a society mm -hmm. are, are happy with it. Mm -hmm. And the only thing is to be, and this is our, at what we are convinced is, it is an ongoing process and it's not an easy process mm -hmm. as journalism is not the easy process. Mm -hmm. uh, artistic journalism is not the easiest process, but the thing is, we have always find the, the correct questions mm -hmm. and we have to ask them again and again and again. Mm -hmm. And it's not solved. And this is the answer. We see it in every mm -hmm. single science. There is always an ongoing research. Mm -hmm. It's ongoing, Absolutely. it's ongoing. And this is the same thing mm -hmm. with the, all this technology and the role for the society. Yeah. So in a way, culture infrastructure, right? Yeah. To dis continue to discuss our future. Uh, thank you very much, Christoph. Uh, it's time, very quick. Uh, 
Uh, after this uh, session, uh, we are going to me and the machines with Nico. And uh, next session, we'll be focusing on trust and also education as well as we have discussed at the end. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have 10 minutes break to change the location. But uh, stay tuned. 10 minutes later, we are starting the second part. But once again, Christoph, thank you. See you in three weeks, I suppose. Ah, yes, sir. So we'll have a second edition as well. Bye bye.
Hi again. Uh, welcome back to Artistic Journalism. So here is the second edition, and I'm very happy to have you, Nicole. Welcome. Hello, Hideya. Thanks for the invitation, and hello to the students participating. Yep. So Nicole uh, Gurines uh, is a head of uh, education and content development at Ars Technica Center. So here we are at me and the machines. So this is a quite unique environment. You can see, uh, you know, this forest and also machines. So uh, it's I and Christoph have discussed. The second part would be focusing on trust, you know, and also education, and also the meaning of art and the journalism uh, in abroad. So Nick Uh, it would be great to introduce mm -hmm. this environment and a, a couple of installations as well. Yes, um, we are here now at the machine learning studio back where the lecture started from before with the donkeys. The machine learning studio in general is our, under, uh, our artificial um, intelligence um, hands-on extension for the Understanding AI exhibition. So as Christoph already mentioned, we start to bring together uh, um, the topics with our visitors and the machine learning studio is a place where they can Absolutely, really yeah. get their hands on yeah, the that's technology. That's, that's a very interesting point, yeah. isn't it? Because normally in this kind of place, there are descriptions and experiences, yeah. but here visitors can really do the practices with AI, right? Yes. They should use their head, but they also should use their hands, mm -hmm. so we don't want our visitors walk around like this as usual in museums we want to touch it touch. and this is perfect in the machine learning studio but what i want to focus on um, today is our me and the machine me and the machines exhibition it's um it's since september part of the machine learning studio and it's staged by the robo psychology mm -hmm. lab of the johannes kepler university yeah. And yeah, why is a robo psychology lab interesting in exhibiting in a museum? It's, um, you know, robo psychology is not at all interested in uh, psych psychotherapeutic sessions for Wally -E or Terminator. They uh, um, do research, they do research on um, psychological wise, of course, psychological research. They're interested in how people do think about to behave or uh, um, feel uh, in encounter mm -hmm. with machines or especially in encountering with uh, intelligent machines. Mm -hmm. So why are we here or why are they here? It's not just an interactive exhibition, it's more, it's also a research place mm -hmm. for them. Um, so yeah, the Robo Psychology Lab is doing their research mm -hmm. studies within our exhibition space. Mm -hmm which is really a, a, a unique symbiosis, I have to say, because, yeah, I mean, uh, I never heard about such a collaboration mm -hmm. um, before, and it's really a win-win a situation, mm -hmm. because for the Robo Psychology Lab, it's, it's really important mm -hmm. to have a, a broad, a mm -hmm. very heterogeneous group. Mm -hmm. um, and where do they get them? It's, a, it's quite a problem for social science mm -hmm. to get a, a diverse, diverse experimental groups. And they have this here. They mm -hmm. have target groups from uh, very young kids to elderly people, from socio-demographic different backgrounds mm -hmm. and, and other various mm -hmm. backgrounds. So this is really a profit mm -hmm. for them. And of course, as well, a profit for us mm -hmm. because um, we enable here or we are enabled here to bring together mm -hmm. our visitors with a very scientific process of experimenting mm -hmm. and studying. And actually, it's a win-win-win situation. Mm -hmm. It's a triple win because I think in a bigger picture, it's also very uh, um, or societies profiting mm -hmm. from such an approach Absolutely, because yeah. if you think um, you can implement mm -hmm. the opinion of a heterogeneous mm -hmm. group mm -hmm. in a v very early state mm -hmm. of uh, um, research mm -hmm. and tech development mm -hmm. it's um, really that what you talked before mm -hmm. technology would be much closer mm -hmm. to the need mm -hmm. of the consumers and not just reflect mm -hmm. the developers, which are mainly uh, 
white and male. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> In yeah, this case, as uh, I and Christopher already discussed, uh, here it's functioned as public open laboratory mm -hmm. to explore the hints uh, about the future you know, directions. Then so here I have a uh, very, in a way, fundamental question to Nicole uh, to discuss you know, the future, especially this AI and also you know, fundamental relation between human and machines. Mm -hmm. So uh, my question to Nico now is uh, what do people trust and believe? So maybe by referring some project, mm -hmm. shall we go? <clears throat> yes, um, trust is a very important word in the connection of or in the discussion and analyzing artificial intelligence. Um, and there's an EU-wide uh, initiative, which is called uh, Trustworthy AI. And, uh, sorry, thank you. And, um, yeah, so trust is something which is very interesting. Uh, the, sorry, uh, um, the, the EU-wide mm. initiative, the uh, Trustworthy AI, this defines um, and determines the frame for what is needed for a trustworthy mm. AI. Um, and of course, this is a term or this is something which the Robopsychology Lab is also very interested in. Absolutely. Of course, and they found, I think, a very funny way via gamification um, to uh, scrutinize this. Mm -hmm. And they try to do this with this Schwammerl hunting game. And the Schwammerl hunting, so. Mushroom uh, hunting. Mushroom hunting, mm -hmm. yes. A Schwammerl means mushroom. And the mushroom hunting um, is quite a good situation because the goal of this game is that you collect mushrooms for your schwammerl goulash. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a meal with mushrooms and of course they have to be edible. You don't want to get yourself poisoned. Yeah. And it's very important for um, uh, um, examine uh, the term trust when something is on stake mm -hmm. uh, and your healthiness is on stake, of course, if you eat something yeah. poisoning. Um, yeah, and so what, you, what visitors do here is they take the tablet and um, look via an artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. which got feeded by thousands of pictures of mushrooms. Um, and and they, they scan the mushrooms and they get an the analyzation of the artificial intelligence if this mushroom is edible or unedible. Mm -hmm. But the important thing is that randomly this analyzation of the mushroom um, pops up in two modes. Mm -hmm. It either pops up in a mode where it just said, okay, this mushroom, this Steinpilz is edible for 80%. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a probability. Probability. Yes. Yeah. Um, and the other mode pops up um, in addition with a heat map mm -hmm. of what the artificial in intelligence looked at when you did the scan. Mm -hmm. So, of course, it's also possible that the uh, artificial intelligence, when it's, it's analyzing the, the pattern, mm -hmm. it's focused more on, on the pine mm -hmm. than maybe on this object. So the result is not right at all. Absolutely. So, and with this, you, with this heat map, you, you have a transparency, mm -hmm. um, what the artificial intelligence focused on. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and so you have to decide after the mode which one you, yeah, you choose. You take. And this is the approach how do you want to, to uh, examine mm -hmm. what, what is needed for, for parameters of yeah. trust. But uh, uh, to the audience today, uh, what are you trusting? Because uh, in the forest, you are now looking for mushrooms, you know, for today's dinner. <laughs> then, so are you trusting yourself? Or are you trusting this? Or are you trusting Google? Or are you trusting experts? You know, there are different ways to trust. And you know, some mushrooms are really lo looking very tasty but super poison, right? Yes. But some mushrooms are so colorful, you know, because of our bias, as we discussed mm -hmm. today, as my impression, 100% poisoned. 
but uh, in real sometimes different. Mm -hmm. It's very tasty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is, a, I think, a tricky part uh, using the metaphor of mushroom because yeah. mushroom has a very defined diversity about the you know uh, ingredient mm -hmm. and contents elements. But once again, what are we trusting? Uh, are we trusting this up? But uh, uh, as Nico mentioned, uh, the probability is a quite interesting point. Also, as we saw today in the machine learning, you know, processing, uh, visualization, it always shows a you know po probability. Eighty yeah. percent elephant, yeah. you know, eighty percent is correct. What what's the you know judgment? So how are you judging if this is the right way to go? I think this is again the element of education, isn't it, yeah. to judge? Mm -hmm. Yes, and of course it doesn't matter if, if, if you, you, you know the algorithm which shows you when you, you surf on the internet yeah. or on Amazon, I don't know. And if you like this, you like this as well. So it's, not, uh, it's, it's nothing crucial mm -hmm. at all. So it's always important to see something at, on mm -hmm. stake to yeah. decide. And also another point is that today we've discussed quite a visual oriented algorithm, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. But uh, of course not only for visuals, yeah. but uh, this smell or touch, mm -hmm. haptic, are still being mm -hmm. you know, developed. I would say those might be very important factors in yeah. the future because <laughs> visually mm -hmm. you know, uh, it's maybe possible to mm -hmm. detect uh, as an overview. But uh, to me, if I, I say, uh, it, what I can trust is if I touch and if the sensor says yes, mm -hmm. uh, maybe I can trust. Mm -hmm. it, also, this is a quite interesting maybe collective analysis mm -hmm. that we can find. You know, what is a ultimately trusting you know, sensor, sense, sense, senses? Yeah. For instance, when you are looking for your mobile or keys, are you trusting your visual confirmation or are you trusting uh, yes, I have touch. I, I, I basically trust haptic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you think? Are you trusting haptic or are you trusting visual? So, of course, uh, humans over 80% uh, use, use the visual perception for perceiving the world. So it's a very strong sense. Mm -hmm. As well with AI, it's working most of the time over via the visual mm -hmm. concept. Um, but of course, haptic or smell, as you mentioned before, is, is something which works very unconsciously, mm -hmm. but gives us so much information, Absolutely. but we are not so aware of that. Mm -hmm. But uh, usually I think it's a very interesting okay, uh, so scientific research. Yeah, this part. might be also the hint yeah. that we can find you know, here. Mm -hmm not just relying on visual, but uh, we might be able to mm -hmm. find other you know, criteria to establish the trust. But uh, let me know more mm -hmm. about how can I trust mm -hmm. and what's the strategy, design strategy mm -hmm. to let us trust, for instance, between human and machine. Yeah. Do you have any example? Yes, of course, we have um, this example here. Let me put that back before. So um, here is... Uh, Media Art Installation. It's a robot arm by um, Emanuel Golob and Magdalena May. Um, and this cooker arm is purely industrial. So you can see there's no decoration except this attachment. Um, but there's nothing um, which is changed. But when I, I, I um, come closer, it reacts like a living being. It pretends being shy in this micro movements. It pretends looking at me. It pretends being curious. And the question here is, the research question here is, um, when um, does it start for the individual um, to feel that there is a social presence with this machine? And I think it's, it's very interesting. Okay, it takes a while, it's not speed dating. <laughs> so it takes a while uh, to build up trust and to build up relationships. It's the same with here. But what we see here is that transparency. What does transparency mean? Transparency means that maybe I can 
Um, I, I find some similarity in my counterpart and this is, uh, um, this is really crucial in, in uh, um, the human which is such a, a highly social mm -hmm. entity. It's so crucial to mirror or to be able to mirror myself mm -hmm. in my counterpart. And I mean, who I'm telling this, you know, probably much more about animism and these things, mm -hmm. but it's such an archaic thing for the human psyche to, to uh, um, pull over uh, anthropomorphistic mm -hmm. parameters mm -hmm. on objects. Mm -hmm. There are definitely no living beings, but we always try to find mm -hmm. some anthropomorphic, which means uh, um, human, human shaped or like, like human shaped or, 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 or you, human like behavior onto objects. Mm -hmm. So what, this is what, what we do here and I'm always so surprised that this uh, works so easily. Mm -hmm. That me as a human knowing this is just a machine. I mean, I'm so, <laughs> I, I totally know that this mm -hmm. is not a living being, mm -hmm. but of course I'm happy if he, it um, touches the, the, the window mm -hmm. when I'm here. So it's really weird. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so. Um, yeah, it's looking for you. Huh? Yes, <laughs> it's looking for me. But, Sorry. Uh, but it's a very interesting metaphor yeah. as uh, uh, Nicole mentioned. So actually for designing such mm -hmm. empathy, so the best way is to utilize human capability, mm -hmm. right? Because a machine doesn't have the, in a way, essential you know, care, you know, yeah. for, for others, because mm -hmm. this is a program or driven yeah. by AI. They just are, pretend. Are, are, yeah, it's just pretending. A, yeah. But uh, for humans, mm -hmm. we are imagining, you know, what he is behaving, what he is thinking, even in a, this very simple movement. Mm -hmm. So this is, a, I would say, the quality of humanity. Mm -hmm. Of course, some people might say, oh, it's, this is just only the capability and the ability of humans. But uh, I think great, you know, great capability and uh, ability, mm -hmm. isn't it? Because yeah. to, in a way, take care. Yeah. Care, caring, you know, uh, you know imagining and uh, pre uh, you know, predicting, you know, so assuming, dreaming, mm -hmm. you know, imagining. I think this is a uh, very core skills that humans uh, yeah. acquired in the you know history, but uh, in the new age of the uh, uh, coexisting with such new in a way techno nature, you mm -hmm. know, techno nature is not anymore in the natural nature environment, but rather those AI machines are being a part of our daily lives. How can we in a way? make such a, you know, uh, natural, in, in, you know, uh, interconnections. Mm -hmm. For doing so, I think this, you know, utilizing human capability mm -hmm. is uh, maybe one of the key element. Yeah. So uh, d did you discuss this kind of stuff with artists or what you are, you know, uh, interesting point about designing Yes, e empathy. Um, designing empathy is, of course, it's it's interesting mm. for artistic questions and artistic work, but it's also very important, I think, for for uh, um, society mm -hmm. and 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 develop technology uh, fitting to the consumers. Mm -hmm. So just to break it break it down, I think it's very important, this research which is mm -hmm. uh, done here, to, you know, we are, or technologies or, or smart, very intelligent mm -hmm. machines, they are ubiquitous, mm -hmm. they are omnipresent mm -hmm. in our daily life. So we can't cancel them mm -hmm. anymore. So we have to uh, um, collaborate with mm -hmm. them, we have to coexist mm -hmm. with them and I think it's, it totally makes sense to still use technolo mm -hmm. uh, technology as tools. Mm -hmm. um, and for this, this research is important that we uh, 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 can better frame 
what we need from these machines mm -hmm. and how they how they should interact mm -hmm. that they still assisting mm -hmm. and supporting mm -hmm. the humans absolutely and uh, to me uh, this you know transparent uh, interface border glass is quite an uh, interesting metaphor yeah because as i mentioned uh, autonomy mm -hmm. should be in a way effectively framed otherwise you mm -hmm. know uh, autonomy is yeah. uh, going to be chaotic yeah but uh, how to consider this invisible you know interface mm -hmm. how to lay out design this mm -hmm. or how to break <laughs> mm -hmm. there are many you know discussion points to coexist with such intelligent mm -hmm. machines yeah. but uh, this you know border uh, transparent of course for here uh, safety reason though yeah. but uh, this is quite a meta metaphoric Na, point and of course yes it's of it's as well you know um, the discussion about yeah we can't uh, we can't um, discriminate um, AI from humans mm -hmm. anymore like voice chatbots mm -hmm. or something so the discussion is all about how could we label artificial intelligence mm -hmm. that it's not just it's not interpreting mm -hmm interpreting humans or mimi or it's not mi mimicry of a human and uh, you don't know mm -hmm. with who you are dealing with mm -hmm. so to label technology or to an, uh, label artificial intelligence i think it's a very important point and kind of this frame and this window yeah. is kind of a label and it labels okay it's a frame mm -hmm. it happens here and yeah yeah Okay, then let's go to the yeah. discussion place. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, so far we discussed the, uh, you know, trust and also the w way to design such kind of, you know, environment. But uh, today uh, I'm very happy that uh, I have Nicole because uh, she is an expert for designing education program. So my question may be uh, not just uh, limiting to AI, but for the future technologies, future society, I think when designing an educational program to discuss the future, what are the important points to consider? The important points to consider. So we, we, we considered already one point mm -hmm. that uh, humans are very social mm -hmm. beings and need to find some uh, mirroring mm -hmm. uh, parameters mm -hmm. of, of the things they can got confronted mm -hmm. with and uh, humans are also I call homo narrans mm -hmm. so they need they need stories they, they need narratives mm -hmm. and the narrative with um, something which is not already here which is in in the future mm -hmm. which is not already part of your daily mm -hmm. life it needs a, a narrative mm -hmm. to um, yeah I mean uh, what Christoph already mm -hmm. said before it's there is a lot of fear mm -hmm. people got confronted mm -hmm. with because of all the new they don't really know mm -hmm. about so you need a story mm -hmm. you need a narrative you need a storyline uh, which you can weave mm -hmm. with the relevance of the daily life of the people mm -hmm. so meaning uh Utilizing future narrative mm -hmm. is uh, one of the key elements, yes, right? Yes, definitely, definitely. It's it's yeah. It's and it's the weaving. Mm -hmm. It's the docking to the the people's life. Mm -hmm. So, so it has to be relevant, mm -hmm. and it has to what what we like to use as well um, emotions. Mm -hmm. And I um, for creating for creating um, encountering in a museum via a workshop via exhibition installations. I created a theory. Uh, emotion based mm -hmm. theory it's the uh, 3c mm -hmm. 3c mm -hmm. theory it's about um, confusion mm -hmm. conversions yeah. and curiosity yep. Interesting. Yeah. these three emotions um, and there are the principles so you with the little bang mm -hmm. not the big bang mm -hmm. the little bang you create this you create confusion mm -hmm. um, this happens with um, in in with the tool art mm -hmm. installation, okay. where you, I don't know, where you shake people, yeah. where you surprise them yeah. in a very beautiful way, but sometimes in a very shocking mm -hmm. way, 
Um, yeah, that's the little bang. Mm -hmm. This is this causes um, th this causes uh, this uh, this emotion, mm -hmm. and all these uh, um, these principles we are able to or we use for different target groups. Mm -hmm. The second one is the level up. Mm -hmm. The level up theory with the conversions, where we start to connect the topics, mm -hmm. the future topics, with the visitors while feeling, uh, starting with, with uh, acquaintance, mm -hmm. with already knowing some facts and building that up to the uh, uh, news, mm -hmm. to the future news. Mm -hmm. And there is the, the third principle for this uh, 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 breakdown, mm -hmm. where we start with, with this new, the new information mm -hmm. about a new technology, a new finding, mm -hmm. which is far away from mm -hmm. the people, but we evoke curiosity mm -hmm. and we break this down to their daily yeah, lives. That's great. I, I, and yeah, good to know about that. Yes. <laughs> and there the tool is vision. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the other one is, is um, history mm -hmm. and familiar facts. And the other one is art. So this I three. See. But in this case, uh, as me as an artist, mm -hmm. uh, artist in you know, artistic projects mm -hmm. that uh, we've shown today mm -hmm. is uh, definitely, you know, uh, including those three C, mm -hmm. you know, elements. Then so uh, as, as this course is named as artistic generalism, mm -hmm. this is kind of provocative or mm -hmm. very kind of confusion combinations. Mm -hmm. While, you know, artistic perspective is very subjective, you know, mm -hmm. in a way as an expression of artists. Journalism is always requested objective, you know, perspective, mm -hmm. right? So th now, you know, uh, this is combined uh, uh, for the future, you know, discussions. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what do you think? What role do you think artistic, in a way, journalists, artistic journalism can play? Mm -hmm. Because uh, in a way, uh, the exhibitions here mm -hmm. uh, look like full of artistic journalism. Mm -hmm. What do you think? So first of all, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think yeah. that art and journalism are opponents. Yeah. So I actually I try to see this as a continuum, mm -hmm. as a continuum because art and journalism are methods mm -hmm. to explain or to report, mm -hmm. to report the world mm -hmm. and raise questions. Yeah. So for me, they are on the same mm -hmm. line. Mm -hmm just on different positions. Mm -hmm. And it's not the way that all of the sudden with artistic journalism, artists all of the sudden do journalism. That's not the case. No, no, no. It's the case that there are collaborations. Mm -hmm. It's the case that um, artists collaborate with scientists mm -hmm. and, and uh, journalists or people who, who do texting and reporting mm -hmm. Like I think about Bellingcat, or mm -hmm. I think about uh, forensic architecture, yeah. or Adam Harvey, yes. or as we saw before, uh, uh, um, the um, yeah, anatomy of AI yeah, project. They are developing the new media and yes. new strategy yeah. to so capture now. Yeah. It's, it's what artistic journalism for me means is, um, is a new collaboration yeah. of different disciplines mm -hmm. and. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a symbiotic mm -hmm. media mm -hmm. what they create. Yeah. And of course, this is um, beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> this is beautiful yeah. for, but, uh, for the, the, the zeitgeist yeah. of, of art. Yeah, but uh, maybe one point that we needed to address is also the position of you know, a mass media now. Mm -hmm. you know? Mass media and also uh, what we are watching you know, in the daily, daily lives. Uh, you know, quite uh, di different, you know, nature uh, compared to many years ago and, and a very, you know, designed and also reflected from the individual you know, preferences, so-called, you know, filter bubbles and, mm -hmm. al and also media are very connected to, yes. you know, powers. Yeah. So this is a kind of a situation that we are living in the almost like uh, fake news. Mm -hmm. And uh, then art, you know, mm -hmm. uh, art is, uh, I would say, popping up uh, the, in a way, position uh, as a request, you know, because uh, not just, you know, delivering the news, but uh, people are maybe looking for a place to stop to think deeply, 
mm-hmm. slowly, mm-hmm. not just consuming and reacting to single you know, news. Mm-hmm. So I think this case, uh, art, you know, and combination with journalism might be able to create a space to stop to think, especially for discussing the future and also for policy as well. Mm-hmm. What do you think this kind of uh, you know, role uh, in, in the future? I think um, it's very important mm-hmm. and um, I also think to, to be aware of mechanisms mm-hmm. of certain media yeah. is um, crucial mm-hmm. for people and I think that artistic journalism, okay, creating a creating kind of a media bubble as well, mm-hmm. but um, I miss I miss a word now. I miss a word now. Now, uh, but making things short, yeah. I think um, I think we. I'm like missing of that yeah, no. story. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I thought uh, our sectonical center yes. is a new kind of space yeah. and also new format to represent mm-hmm. such artistic journalism, you know? Yes. Because today's this robot, mm-hmm. this was never positioned as a future terror about the interrelation between human yes. and robot. But uh, instead of reading text mm-hmm. or articles uh, on the newspaper, this is much, you know, powerful yeah. to uh, you know, let people understand the meaning of this. That's, you know. that's totally the little bang yeah. <laughs> method. Uh, ab- absolutely. That's, that's yeah. totally the little yeah. bang yeah. method. And that's actually the, the DNA mm-hmm. of our Ars Electronica's exhibition. Mm-hmm. Because using, um, using an artwork mm-hmm. for opening up, for softening, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> for softening uh, uh, um, the interest, yeah. Uh, to, to, yeah, just to open up the heart to uh, um, getting in all mm-hmm. the, the facts and knowledge. Of course, I mean, we're dealing with topics, mm-hmm. they are not easy, they are difficult mm-hmm. to understand. It's artificial intelligence. I mean, man, you have to know a lot, uh, or people think they have to know a lot about mathematics and, and informatics, um, and they are very, really difficult topics mm-hmm. we are showcasing here and discussing here. But you don't have to be an expert in mathematics mm-hmm. to understand Absolutely. artificial intelligence. Yeah. You just have, um, yeah, you just have to feel where where is the importance for you. Mm-hmm. And I think um, art, um, art projects, art installations can s- much more easily access. touch you, yeah. access you than um, a fact sheet Absolutely. can yeah. do. Yes. Yeah. So I think uh, that's a really clear, you know, conclusion (laughs) and statement (laughs) today, because why we are, you know, talking about today artistic journalism, especially edition, was understanding AI. Of course, you can read a book, you can read the newspaper, but uh, this kind of environment uh, allow us to dive into Mm -hmm. the time to think about the future society but uh, through the you know, 3C yeah. <laughs> method that she mentioned today, but uh, we, we could really continue to create this kind mm-hmm. of an open space where people can access to the, you know, uh, in a way, difficult you yeah. know, uh, issues. Yeah. Right? And that I also want to add that mm-hmm. I think it's also important with you talking about access. Mm-hmm. It's of course you can have access via Wikipedia to such a big knowledge, yeah. to the library of the yeah. world, but it's also important that you have um, the direct encounter mm-hmm. and um, intelligence is not just about collecting facts and knowing facts, yeah. it's also about uh, um, your, your body, your body in, in position to yeah. other things um, in, in, in addition uh, makes the word uh, intelligence for me Ab- as a whole. Ab- absolutely. So yes. not, again, not just visual information. Yes. This haptic smell and the temperature, moisture, and flow of noise. Mm-hmm. So this is a, maybe the setting to discuss such future. 
So uh, it's time, and uh, I can't stop <laughs> this kind of very creative, you know, interesting discussions. But I hope you enjoy it today's special, you know, mode uh, to explore the Earth Electronica Center. So today uh, we had a wonderful guest, uh, Christoph Kremer and Nicole. So thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, so our public lecture will be uh, held soon. So please uh, join us uh, also the next uh, edition. So see you next time. Bye-bye. See you. Bye.